Greetings, comrades. And I've been playing a lot of the New Hearts of Iron DLC recently. And I do have a lot to say about that. But before I got into that, I really wanted to move on from Terra Invicta and get all this information that's in my head out there for you guys. So if you watch the review of Terra Invicta, one of my biggest complaints about the game was its inability to really communicate to you the best ways of how to play the game, what you should be doing, what everything does. So what I've done is distill the nine best and most important pieces of information that I think will help you succeed at Terra Invicta as fast as possible. To try as much as possible with a complex game like this to cut straight to the chase. So without further ado, I've got nine tips here for you that will hopefully make the process of learning Terra Invicta a lot easier and more enjoyable. So let's move into the very first point I have for you, which is do not play Terra Invicta like it's two separate games. One of the things you'll see a lot when people talk about the game is that it is basically two games, a game where you're on Earth than a game where you're in space. Some people have even argued that it's in fact three games. But the point here I really want to stress to you guys is when you are starting up Terra Invicta, you need to play both of these games simultaneously. When I initially started playing the game, I expected, given a lot of the conversation I'd seen around it, for it to somehow just magically morph from a geopolitical simulator on Earth to a galactic combat simulator. I had this kind of idea that one game would stop and the other would start. And what this resulted for me in the long run was vastly falling behind in my science to the point where I had absolutely no hope in catching up and beating the aliens. And I didn't realize that this campaign was over until far long after I had actually lost in practice. As like a beached whale, I struggled on Earth as the aliens progressively brought more and more ships and more and more armies onto the planet. And my pathetic science had no hope in combating them. So the next campaign, I made sure that I did not neglect my space research, and I was handsomely rewarded for my foresight. As from the get-go, investing into space paid dividends in the late game, as it allowed me to not only snag the best resource nodes before other factions got there, it also allows you to start building up your war chest of necessary space resources for the late game. In addition, in the early to mid game, you can use these space resources to build new outposts and new stations without having to use boost resources from Earth. And if you play your cards right, eventually you'll have a pool of boost and a pool of space resources, allowing you to build from whichever pool you choose and effectively doubling your total resource pool. So long story short, don't neglect your space game, get in on it early, and you will be handsomely rewarded for it when you actually need to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the aliens. Moving on to our second tip, this one is very quick, which is that as much as you possibly can when building your space stations, use solar arrays instead of fission or fusion nuclear reactors. So when it comes to powering your space stations, you have two options, usually a solar array or some sort of nuclear reactor. And generally speaking, you always want to choose the solar array. The only time you don't want to use the solar array is when you're not close enough to the sun in order to get power from it. And the reason you want to use the solar array over the nuclear reactor is that it requires vastly less upkeep to maintain. And initially, it won't matter too much, but over the long game, as you start to stack up these nuclear reactors, you'll notice a substantial drain on your resources that if you had just built solar arrays, wouldn't exist. So a small tip there, but one that can definitely hinder you if you're not paying attention. 
Our third tip is to specialize your counselors. One of the mistakes I made was trying to make all of my counselors jack of all trades and not really knowing where I should invest their experience points into. However, as the game progresses and the missions your counselors will embark on get tougher, they're going to need much higher stats to succeed. So generally speaking, you are going to want to have four counselors specialized to the maximum, which is 25 points, in each of the following categories. One is in persuasion, and this is for taking over countries, getting control points, recruiting counselors, etc. The next is espionage, and this is going to be your assassin counselor, as well as the counselor who can purge and take over other points from other factions. So he's your bruiser. And then you'll need to have one with a maximum in investigation. And this is for your own investigations of enemy counselors, but also for detaining enemy counselors. It requires an investigation stat rather than an espionage stat. And then lastly, you'll want one to max out in command, and that will be for attacking enemy and alien installations. Anyway, if you have a counselor that is able to max out in each one of those four areas, you'll pretty much be able to handle anything the game throws at you. And with that out of the way, let's move to number four. Number four is don't tunnel vision on science. That is, I should be specific here, high cost science. You'll notice as you progress through the game that some projects are significantly more expensive than others. And those expensive projects are going to hold up a research slot for quite some time. While some of these high cost technologies may seem alluring, almost always they are a siren song and your time and investment would generally speaking be better spent in researching four or five smaller techs rather than wasting all that time with one big tech. And I had this issue compound me over time where I was spending my campaign investing in these high class science projects thinking that I would get an advantage but all that ended up happening was that I was falling further and further behind everyone else. So make sure you're not tunnel visioning on those high cost science techs. And if you are, make sure it's for a specific purpose and do so sparingly because there are going to be times when you need to invest in these high cost technologies to advance the game forward. So it's important you know when to invest and when not to invest. That being said though, as a general rule, it's better to spend your time getting five smaller technologies than one big one. And with that, let's move on to our fifth tip, which is don't rack up the enemy's hostility too much at the beginning. I ran into this mistake where I thought that I would gain an advantage by finding and killing all of the enemy agents on Earth and trying to keep Earth as alien free as possible. Unfortunately, all that this did for me was gain the ire of the aliens who then flew around and destroyed all of my various space stations, which crippled my science to an irreplaceable degree. It's much better to lay low and slowly build up your fleet and slowly build up your forces and then wait for the opportune moment to Pearl Harbor the aliens. And if you draw too much attention to yourself, the aliens will destroy all of your science facilities and production facilities before you even have the chance to get off the ground. So hunting down the aliens is a, another siren song that by and large you want to avoid. However, there are going to be times when you need to take out an alien agent, particularly if they are mind controlling your population over and over again, in that case, yes, you got to take them out, but don't go overboard because if you do, that's when the aliens are going to start to get upset. You can take a few hits to their hostility, sure, but again, it's not something you want to overdo. So our sixth tip is, I guess, kind of two in one. Our sixth tip is Central Asian Union overpowered. And by extension, I also want to say 
that for the most part though these kind of large factions that these kind of large massive union states are not as worth it as they would first appear so the great thing about the central asian union is that it is a very small cost investment to research the technology and it's also very easy to control all of these nations and bring them together and then lastly considering that kazakhstan has a massive boost capacity already once you bring all these central asian nations together all of a sudden you are going to have a country which has double the boost capacity of the united states it's crazy how low-key good this formable nation is for the minimal amount of investment that it takes to create it that being said however most of the other formable nations in this game require a significant investment in both science and time and generally speaking that investment is better spent in other places so while it may be tempting to invest 20,000 science in building the North American Union, at the end of the day, that 20,000 science would have been much better spent in other places. And now we move on to number seven. And this may seem as a contradiction from one of our earlier statements, but what I'm talking about here is specifically when the aliens will land armies on Earth and begin their full-scale invasion. When the aliens start doing that, you want to take them out as soon as possible. Don't let them gain a foothold at all. You can let their little agents run around a little bit and do their thing, but once they actually land, you got to get them off the planet as soon as possible. Because there is no means for kicking an alien administration off of Earth besides military conquest. You can't use your agents, you can't use any espionage, you can incite counterinsurgencies and make it possible for various nations to try and break free. However, that is a very long and arduous process. Much better just to invade those bastards initially, because if you just let them sit there, all you're gonna do is let them get stronger and have to invade them later anyway. So do absolutely everything in your power to prevent an alien administration from showing up on Earth. And if one does, declare war on it immediately because there is absolutely nothing that it can give you in terms of an advantage. All right, hope that's clear. So we are actually pretty quick to wrapping up here and let's move into number eight, which is that missiles are your friends. So when it comes to the actual ship-to-ship -ship combat of Terra Invicta, it may seem overwhelming at first, as there are so many different types of weapons and modules, and modifications, but I can help you ignore a lot of those things with one simple tip, which is that missiles are your friends. So why are missiles your friends? Well, they come with numerous advantages and very limited disadvantages. The main advantage to having missiles is that you don't need to worry about your ship's positioning. Your missiles will launch and lock on, hopefully, and take it from there. Your ships don't need to maneuver into a specific position in order to hit your enemy. Next is that missiles are powerful. A few direct hits from a missile will destroy even the largest alien vessels. And lastly, if you have enough missiles fired at an enemy ship, you can easily overwhelm their defenses. Most defenses are based on a point defense system, which is a little laser which will shoot out and destroy any incoming projectiles. However, it's very easy to overwhelm them if you fire enough missiles at a ship. And before you know it, the enemy fleet will implode faster than a dying star. The main disadvantage with missiles is that they are very limited in quantity and once your ship fires all your missiles, if it doesn't have any alternative weapon systems, then it is effectively useless for that battle. However, if you give your ships fast enough 
engines, they can just flee after firing all their missiles, reload, and then come back again. Eventually, however, missiles will begin to have diminishing returns in the late game. However, initially, they are your most invaluable friends at the beginning of your combat with the aliens. For such a low science investment, there really is no better bang for your buck in terms of early weapon systems. All right, so let's move into our ninth and final tip, which is to make sure that you are profitable with all of your resources, but bear in mind that some are more important than others. And here I am specifically talking about the five space resources. The quote unquote earth resources are of course important as well. However, the space resources are what will end up winning you the game. Initially, when you're setting up your space economy, you're going to make sure that you want to have at least a profitable amount of every one of those five resources so that over time you can start to build up a large pool of them for later use. Another thing to remember here is that if you start to dip into the negative territory with any of your space resources, that deficit will be made up in boost as Earth is considered to have an unlimited amount of resources the main difficulty being getting it off Earth and into space in the first place. And that is represented by a diminishment in your overall boost capacity. So if you're noticing that you're struggling with boost, it's probably because you have a deficit in one of these space resources. But what do I mean that some are more important than others? Well, two in specific, your water, and your volatiles are most likely to be absorbed by your space stations as an upkeep resource. Therefore, once you have your bases covered and you're making at least some in all your resources, you are going to want to prioritize water and volatiles as your next go-to areas. While it certainly is nice to have a pool of all available resources, if you have a large pool of water and volatiles you will be thanking yourself every single day when it actually becomes time to fight the aliens and if you want a, another one that is a tier below that base materials is also a important one to have as it's used in obviously a lot of construction however it's not used so much in upkeep but it can be and with that, we have come to the end of our list. I hope this was pretty jam-packed with information. I wanted to make this as quick and concise and informative for you guys as possible. I know that Terra Invicta is quite a complicated game with a considerable amount of moving parts, but once you understand what's going on, the game becomes a lot easier, obviously, but also it becomes way more enjoyable. And with that, I hope you guys found this helpful, and until next time, this is the Comrade signing off, and you guys take care.